Good morning, and let us morning. remember that this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And aren't we glad to hear some special music and swing a little in our seats while we're standing up, whichever way? It's just wonderful to be here together. Welcome everyone to worship. Uh, people from Tomales. People from the two our congregation, any friends and neighbors that are coming, and welcome to our extra musicians. It's such a joy to see you again this year after we skipped last year, our last year. So it's wonderful to worship together on this Labor Day weekend. Are there any other announcements? No? Then let us swing a little and sing a little as we sing together hymn number 637, O oh, Sing to the Lord a New Song. Prayer to the God who 
loves us, who creates us, who calls us to life and new life, who sustains us by the power of the Holy Spirit. To that God, the one God, the Holy One of Israel, Jesus called him the Father. To that God, we pray, and we pray on this Sunday, that is Labor Day Sunday, and we pray an older prayer from a prayer book written for the special holiday, a national holiday such as this, for our nation, for our people, for justice and peace for all. Please join me as we pray together. Almighty God, you have given us this good land as our heritage. Make us always remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless our land with honest industry, sound learning, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. May us who come from many nations with many different languages and the united people defend our liberty.
It's a birthday. Yeah. And how many years, how old are you? Four. Four. <laughs> Hunter will be four. And uh, Hunter is here with his auntie. Mm -hmm. And grandma and grandpa are in the pew. So Hunter, will you have a nice birthday party tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun, won't it? And what else is tomorrow? Do you know what else is tomorrow? It's, it's Labor Day. Labor Day? Yeah. yeah, it's Labor Day. And lots of us will celebrate Labor Day, huh? So you have a double celebration, huh? Your birthday and Labor Day. It's great. Now, Labor Day um, celebrates everyone who labors and works, right? Does it include most of you? Probably all of us, right? And do you remember what one of those German 19th century philosophers said? All labor is honorable. His name was Karl Marx. I studied him in middle school. Just like you studied, let's say you studied the American Revolution. Karl Marx in middle school. So all labor is honorable. Remember that. And remember that when you have a student job and you're 18 and you work weird, work some weird, weird kind of thing. Ever done that? Or you just work a short time job or job that's just difficult. All labor is on. And we give thanks to that for that today. And we also give thanks for Hunter, who has a birthday on Labor Day. Yes. That is so awesome. Thank you. So happy birthday, Hunter. Four years old is pretty cool. <laughs>
is preached by Jesus through words of justice and peace, and is enacted by Jesus through deeds of compassion and healing. The good news that the kingdom of God is at hand is truly at the heart of Jesus' message and ministry. And as you know, we keep exploring what that means and what that looks like. That's what we've been doing in August and this month too. However, in today's gospel passage, we find Jesus not in his typical preaching and healing journey. He's not on his usual mission trip through the local towns and villages around the Sea of Galilee. Instead, now I want you to imagine the map of Palestine. Instead, Jesus has journeyed northwest from Galilee, journeyed to the Mediterranean coast. He has gone beyond Jewish lands into Gentile territory, and he's in the region of Tyre, that's a coastal city, and Sidon, another coastal city a little further north. So the question is, is Jesus taking some time off by himself? I'm thinking, is he maybe going on a retreat? And that house entire into which he comes, to whom does it belong? What, what is that all about? We have no answers from the text, though it is clear that Jesus has stepped beyond his usual territory and ministry. And also notice he doesn't want anyone to know that he's there, and yet he is to put to work while he's there, really against his will. And there's this woman who approaches Jesus. And she is not silent, she's not furtive, and you may remember this other woman that came to Jesus, the woman with the flow of blood who was coming furtively and silently, hoping to be undetected. But this woman comes openly and falls down at Jesus' feet and begs him to cast out the demon from her daughter. And the demon could be any illness that makes her daughter sweat. Now remember, Jesus is in a different setting. He's outside of his usual surroundings. And the person begging him is different from any of the people with whom Jesus typically associates. So, this is a woman in a man's world. She's not Judean or Galilean or even just Samaria, but she's Syrophoenician. She's not Jewish, but she's non-Jewish, a Gentile, a Greek. And she obviously speaks a different language if she's identified in the text as Greek. She speaks Greek as her main language. And still, she wants help for her daughter from Jesus. So in other words, this woman is of another background, race, religion, and language than Jesus. And still she appeals to him. And Jesus objects. Jesus tells this woman that he's come to proclaim the kingdom of God and usher in the kingdom of God for his own people in Galilee and Judea. He does not want to deal with other people, with foreigners, with dogs, as Jews would call those others in an unflattering way. I was thinking that this sort of language is perhaps not all that different from what some of our politicians, and sometimes we ourselves, call people from Asia and from Central America and from other countries uh, from where people come to our country as refugees. Just remember the Afghan invasion. Do you remember that? The Afghan invasion, which some of our politicians decried just a week or two ago. So, we do it too. Now, amazingly, 
the Syrophoenician woman does not slink away, does not hide when Jesus rebukes her, but she keeps hunkering down at his feet and stays strong for his, her daughter's sake. She responds to Jesus' objection and turns his insult to actually bolster her plea. If she and her daughter are regarded as dogs, she says, they will be glad of any crumbs that fall from the table of the children of God. Any crumbs are good enough for her. You know, these are stunning words by the Syrophoenician woman who was in a truly desperate spot. And they're following the stunning words by Jesus, who is in a very human frame of mind in this episode. But I think what is most amazing is that through the words these two people exchange, through the speech and response across so many differences in terms of culture and background and religion, through all this, hearts are opened and minds are changed. And notice that a changed mind here is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of faith and trust in God. And Jesus puts it plainly, for saying that, he says to the woman, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. And then the kingdom of God is breaking in for this woman and her daughter by the gracious words that Jesus speaks at the end of this episode. And by the mighty work of healing he does and responds to her words. And then the woman shows her faith, not just by coming to Jesus, but also now by going away, going home to her daughter and indeed all is well, just as Jesus said. This is such a puzzling passage. It has always fascinated me. We may wonder, I think all of us, why Jesus went to Tyre in the first place. Surely he realized that he would be on foreign soil and would be dealing with those others, those foreigners. Now, wouldn't you know what biblical scholars have wondered about this too at great length? There's much ink spilled, and they found all kinds of explanation to, for Jesus' initial response to the Syrophoenician woman. They say, Jesus was tired or on a retreat, and he didn't want to deal with anyone. Or they say, Jesus was testing this woman, testing her faith. Or they say, this is just irony in his speech, especially in light of what Jesus had er said earlier about what comes out of the human heart and the human mouth. Remember we talked about that last week? Or others still say Jesus is always represented as a very, in a very human way in this gospel according to Mark, so perhaps this is the evangelist's perspective, and so on. All kinds of explanations. Now here's what I think. I think Jesus was not testing this woman. But I'm wondering if Jesus was testing himself. Testing his own sense of call and mission. He went to the region of Tyre, into this foreign territory, and may have wondered, is there a call for me here to proclaim the kingdom of God? He may have asked for a sign from God, a clear indication of what God's intent was for him and for his earthly ministry. And then comes a sign in the form of a pleading mother who is good with words and clever and desperate and checks her pride at the door if she can just find healing for her daughter. And Jesus.
Jesus takes this as a sign, unexpected though it may be, of a woman pleading with bold and courageous words. Because now Jesus goes even further into Gentile territory, all the way to Sidon, further north. And on his way back to Galilee, he detours somehow through the area of the Decapolis, a region of ten towns settled by Greek-speaking populations to the southeast of Galilee. And you might want to get your Bible atlas out for this story. Very interesting. It's not clear from the text where people come who have so much faith in Jesus that they bring the deaf to him, to man to him, and, and then beg him for a healing, beg him again, just like the woman. Only this time, Jesus responds without hesitation. He responds without rebuke. And he pressures the deaf mute men away from the crowd. And then he uses his hands, his fingers, to unstop the ears, and he uses his spittle to loosen the tongue of that man. And he looks into heaven with a sigh. Notice that sigh. And he gives the command, be open. And this being Labor Day weekend, I wonder if Jesus is sighing at the increased labor that this mission will bring for him and his followers now that the Gentiles are to be included in the kingdom of God. Of course, all of us involved in the work of the church for Jesus' sake know that it is always way more work than we thought, than we signed up for. And I see some of you nodding. And I think Jesus was sighing about it as we sometimes sigh about it. And even if Jesus wanted to keep this new development of a broader mission field, quiet, a mission field that included the whole world, all Gentiles. It's not possible because the formerly deaf mute man who had no voice now raises his voice in joy and grateful proclamation about what Jesus has done for him. And this morning's reading from Isaiah and also the call to worship from the Psalms, both remind us miracles of healing, just like streams of water in the desert of our lives, those are sure signs that the kingdom of God is at hand. So, this Labor Day weekend, I invite us to ponder the value of work, of all who labor among us, and of the many hours that we each spend in service to our family and community. So think about labor and Labor Day weekend. I also invite us to ponder the meaning of signs. The signs we ask for, the signs that guide us, on our way through life. And the signs that may be entirely unexpected and we think this can't be true. And yet they are. And I invite us finally to consider the kingdom of God as a place where no one is designated as other, as different, but where all are one in Christ where all are included, welcomed, cherished, and worthy of healing and wholeness. May we all move the words of this story in our hearts all week long. Amen.
I invite us now to stand and sing for, for the Syrophoenician woman and the Jews and the Greek and also for people from Tuak and Tomales together and for all that are united in Christ and seek to be united in Christ. We are one in the Spirit. Hymn number 300 verses 1 through 3. Yes. New 
good job for clothing. It's wonderful. Carol. Uh, continued prayers for the baby that's in UC, the baby Duke. you then to find the insert in your bulletin and let us pray together the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and prayers. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You come with power to judge and save us, destroying the works of the wicked and delivering the poor from their distress. Therefore we praise you, joining the song of the universal church and the heavenly choir. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Jesus fed the hungry, cast out demons, healed the sick, liberated the oppressed, and extended your grace to all people. Remembering your goodness and grace in Christ our Lord, we offer ourselves to you in gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Praise the Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup, and make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Teach us to truly love our neighbors, honoring the equality each of each person, and tending to the basic human needs of everyone. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and the unity of the Spirit, we bless you and praise you, God of glory, now and forever. And we praise you, O oh God, for this joint service where both churches share together and celebrate your goodness and give thanks to you. And we give thanks for the jazz band and the special music we're having today and the joy that brings to our hearts and soul. And we give thanks for Labor Day weekend, for remembering the hard work of so many people, including our own, and for remembering also that all work is honorable, that it is done with a servant heart. Gracious God, we also lift up to you those people who need special healing, special courage, comfort, assurance. We pray for Kogan, and his new job that is starting this week. And we pray that you would bless him in this new stage of life, and may it all go well. We pray for little baby Duke, Duke is her last name, who 
who was born with some physical challenges and had to undergo surgery. We prayed for her parents and her great aunt Carol. And we just pray that things will eventually turn out all right. Keep this child in your arms, O oh God, and bless her. We pray for Lisa, the mother-in-law of Jenna, who is also, of course, the mother of, of Hunter, who turns four tomorrow. We pray for Lisa, who is on dialysis and has heart issues. And she's only in her 50s and is really struggling health-wise. Oh God, be with Lisa. May she pull through this challenging stretch of her health and be returned to her family soon. We pray for Susie Harms and her husband Lee, who's had heart issues and issues with her pancreas and is slowly recovering, oh God. Be with Lee and Susie and the family that cares for them. And we pray for women, oh God, after we've had heard the story of a woman speaking with Jesus. For women everywhere, women in Syria, where this woman was from, and women, women in Afghanistan, and women in our own country and everywhere around the world where they're facing difficult times. Keep them strong. Keep them focused on you. Help them. Help them, we pray. And we pray for all service people. The lost of whom in Afghanistan, just evacuated early this week after some loss of life these final days. O oh God, have mercy on all those who mourn. And we pray for our firefighters. We pray for all dealing with the aftermath of horrendous rains and flooding. We pray for all in this country and beyond who are struggling with natural disasters and their aftermath. Grant courage, O oh God, and hope and help. Hear us now as we add our own silent prayers. Let us now pray as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Covenant in my blood 
shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. So every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. So please let us share the gifts of God for us, the people. Let us pray. Oh God, you feed us throughout your journey through life. You feed us by your word, by giving us stories to ponder and puzzle about, by challenging us to grow in faith getting us to open our hearts and our minds to the new realities you unfold before us. And you also feed us through the sacrament of bread and the cup that are for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. You give us strength new courage, and new hope. Oh God, may we keep walking on your way and follow our Lord Jesus Christ. Always. Amen. We have two more wonderful hymns. One is, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory, and it is one of our uh, hymns for a ho national holiday. It's in our hymn book, number 354, so let us sing that, and um, you may stand and, and swing a little bit. <laughs>
we are from across the sea or from right here, uh, regardless of where we labor and what we do, we are all welcomed and included and shared, and we deserve healing and wholeness. That is our God's desire for all of us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you, now and forevermore. Amen.